Okay, so uh, okay, so we're going to talk a bit about what FPGAs are today and how they're really built. So, anyone want to take a stab at this? You, you, a lot of you have already been working on them. All of you, most of you, have taken classes. What what is an FPGA definition? A field programmable gate array. Okay, field program with gate array. What, what in the world does that mean? To have an array of gates that you could program in the field? Yeah, an array of gates that you can program in the field. Okay. Okay. So, so uh, if you said that to your mother or your father, um, would they maybe they would uh, know all what you're talking about. But for a lot of us, uh, that's not how I tell my parents about FPGAs. So uh, how do you tell other normal members of society about what an FPGA is? I would say it's a good middle ground between a computer and an engineer designed civic circuit. Okay, okay. So it's a middle ground, okay. I'm gonna come back to that. Yeah. It's it's a type of circuit board where you basically do whatever you want on it. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna be nitpicky on terminology today. Okay. So it's not a circuit board, okay. Often often when when we give them to you, they're on circuit boards, okay? But it's really just a chip, okay? And you could put them in any product. But when we're prototyping designs on them, we like them on development boards because they come with lights and switches and UARTs and IOs and stuff, okay? So we give them to you on development boards, but it is just a chip. What does it do? Ah, whatever you wanted to. It's so magical. Okay. So exactly what you tell it to. Okay. So um okay, it was also said it um it kind of sits between like a, a processor and I uh, will say an ASIC. Okay, we'll we'll save up finding these for a moment. So a processor, a CPU. It does whatever you tell it to. So by definition, it is the same as an FPGA. No. Okay. What's the difference between a CPU and an FPGA? FPGA works at the hardware level. Okay. So okay. It physically represents the actual logic gates, the gates in the FPGA that yeah. are actually represented by the FPGA. Okay. okay. Yeah. Adam? The instructions to an FPGA simply make connections between the elements, whereas a CPU receives instructions that actually execute in a core. Okay, yeah. So this is a, a fundamental difference that I want you to like get in your head. And I think it'll be more clear at the end of end of my little presentation here. But a, a CPU takes instructions, and we often say that we program it, you write a program. And, and every time each one of you in 220 say that you write a program for your, for your FPGA, a little part of me dies inside. No, not really. Like, I, I cringe a little, but that's okay. It's just you, you just are learning. I'm sure I said the same thing. But sometimes we say, we, sometimes we like using the word configure instead just to make ourselves different. We're really still programming the FPGA, but it's different. It's not a program. The FPGA is not there to execute a set of steps like a program. It is really an FPGA can implement arbitrary digital circuits. Okay. So it can be programmed to connect the wires together to make a circuit. But at the end of the day, it's no different than if you made that circuit on your breadboard. It is not a set of instructions that it runs through with loops and jumping around like a program. It's completely different than that, okay? Yes, you, you get a bit stream and you might think if you've gone through 220, I had a bit stream, I programmed my FPGA, I, got, I went to 330, I got, a, I got an L file and I programmed my embedded CPU. It seems pretty similar, okay? But, but they're totally different and your CPU, you, 
put a software program in memory and a CPU is a special kind of circuit that reads instructions from memory and, and does those steps. Whereas in FPGA, we are literally configuring and connecting the wires and making a circuit like you would on your breadboard, except on your breadboard, I don't know, once you're getting past like 10 or 20 wires, it's too many. Okay, on our FPGAs, we're okay with millions of wires that we're connecting. So it's, it's just a totally different scale of what we can accomplish. Okay, so questions on that? We're gonna, we're gonna like dive in like microscope, zoom in and look at what they look like on the inside, okay? Um, but conceptually, does, are you okay with that? This doesn't have to be like class. You can just like ask questions, interrupt me as much as you want. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about these things. So, so we talked a little bit about a CPU. Okay. And ASIC is, stands for Application Specific Integrated Circuit. That means we actually fabricate a circuit to do one job, one specific thing. So where might you find ASICs? Inside your car? Yeah, you hear of chip shortage. There's a chip shortage for cars, okay? These are, are special kinds of, all sorts of kinds of chips that the auto manufacturers wanna buy. They, they might not be, really automotive specific they could be but maybe they're just like memories or little microcontrollers or, or things like that but but maybe the automakers decided that it's that's the one they want to use and they've certified it so uh okay so where else do you see a6 okay your phone's gonna have a bunch of them in it okay uh your your television, okay, so these TV units, they're gonna have ASICs to do kind of image processing and probably handle the HDMI signal and, and do things like that with it, okay. Uh, maybe even your camera sensor, your digital camera, or probably even your camera sensor on, on your phone, probably, I mean, has an image processor. You know, when, when Apple kind of releases their new iPhone or, or whoever it is, they go up on stage and they talk about all these different processors and some of them are CPUs, but not all of them. Some of them, you know, like they've got the fancy bionic image sensor or whatever they call. I can't remember all the marketing names, right? Okay, so, so in some ways it's kind of a funny definition because I could sit here and argue with you. I could say, oh, well, really an FPGA is just a type of ASIC its job is to be configurable and implement uh, implement uh, arbitrary digital circuits, okay? But then you might argue, well, it's not really a specific application at that point. You could say the same thing about CPUs. It, it's a circuit, its job is to read x86 or ARM instructions from memory and do those things, right? It, it's, it has a role, um, but it's still some, some custom chip, okay? so. Okay, so let, let's compare these a little bit. So kind of on the, the speed, let's, let's do, I don't know, I haven't really planned out how I'm gonna do this. Okay, so which one's faster? Okay, yeah, so, so generally the, the scale looks something like this. Okay, and what orders of magnitude are we talking about here? It, it wouldn't be crazy to say like 10X maybe, okay? The ASIC might be 10X faster than your FPGA, which might be 10X or 100X faster than your CPU, depending on the application, it, it really depends, but okay. But we're not, generally we're not building a whole custom chip to be just 30% faster or twice as fast. We're expecting a lot of return for all that money that we're, we're okay. Uh, so what about power? That's another thing we care about. Why do we care about power? Heat? Battery, okay. So, um, okay, so which uses more power? Okay, more power. Less okay, and again, maybe 10x wouldn't be a crazy step from in kind of either direction from the FPGA. Okay, so 
so far we've said the CPUs are the worst at everything. So what are they the best at? Yeah. Um, development time. Yeah. Okay, or or we can do the inverse of this and say time to market. Okay, the CPU is much faster. I can deploy new updates to Google Chrome today if I wanted to. Okay, if I put a new chip, if I make an ASIC for my Ford car, I'm probably not like releasing a new one for, for a few years or something like that, All right? So, um, so that then there's also kind of this idea of, There are two M's and reprogrammable? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So you kind of have the scale of reprogrammability. Okay, where where maybe I mean the CPU and the FPGA are both fully reprogrammable. It takes more development time to do that for the FPGA. Uh, the ASIC's not really reprogrammable. So I don't know. No, <laughs> and, and we'll say kind of yes and and yes. <laughs> so uh, okay, so uh, we we missed some one. We, we probably yeah. care about price. Okay, price is a little bit tricky because there's two things we care about with price. We care about the price that we pay to develop it up front, and then we care about the price to make each one. So if you take an engineering cost, maybe you talk about non-recurring or recurring engineering costs. Okay, so, so the price of an ASIC is really expensive to make your first one, okay? But then to make additional ones, it's actually quite cheap. So, so if you're Samsung and you're gonna make a million TVs, it's fine to make an ASIC, okay? But if you're some Department of Defense and you're putting up a handful of satellites, maybe you just wanna use some FPGAs. So, and so kind of depending on your application, you kind of have to look at the scale of all these things and decide what's important. And where the FPGA really shines is the fact that it can be faster than software, but get you out the door and be more reprogrammable than building a custom chip. And it's better in smaller quantities. Okay, so, um, Anything on that? Any questions, comments, concerns? Okay, so next part of my talk here, let's make an FPGA. So we're gonna make something that can make any digital circuit. So essentially what parts do we need? So we're gonna go back in time. When was the first FPGA made? I don't even know. 1958. No, it's way later than that. What, 90s? Late? I don't remember. It so, is late, but it is later. It's not. It's like not like back in the 60s. This is what they had. 84. 84, okay. They had what they call programmable logic arrays, which are a little different architecture than FPGAs. Yeah, maybe we'll kind of differentiate them. I'm not an expert, but I kind of know roughly from, I don't know, had some questions on it in my BLSI class 10 years ago or something. But <laughs> okay, so um, so yeah, so 84 was the first one, but probably commercially not, probably wasn't really that popular commercially until the 90s, I'm guessing, right? So uh, so it's it's a lot newer than than kind of CPUs. Okay, so what do you need? What, what are the fundamentals? If you want to make digital circuits, you can think back to 220 when you, we taught you what digital circuits were, what are the fundamental building blocks? And or not gates. Okay, so, so you want some ands and ors and nots, flip flops. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna generalize it a little bit. Okay, so let's so say you, you want to do some, some um, I'll say you, you want to make some 
Yeah. Some combinational logic, or otherwise, you want to make you want to have some logic gates. Okay. So I don't know if you talked about this in two twenty. You you can make. You don't really need every sort of logic gate under the sun. You could even with just nands, nands and knots, you can make anything, any logic expression you want. Okay. Uh, okay. So we need some gates. Okay, so these are going to basically do the do the yeah logical math or expressions for us. What else do we need? Clock. A clock. Okay. Yeah, I mean we need a clock wire, but yeah, yeah. We'll just ignore him for now. But I agree. I just don't want him. I want him to be down by the end the bottom of the list. So, what else do you need? Storage. Storage. Okay, I like that. Storage, okay. So how do we normally make storage? What's the simplest element of storage that we do in digital design? Okay, a latch, I hate latch, we'll say a flip-flop. <laughs> okay, so flip-flop, or if we're fancier, we have uh, memories, but we don't really need memories. We could get by with just flip-flops if we wanted to. Okay. We could make memories out of, if we had infinite flip-flops, we, we could make memories. Okay. So, and, and I agree with Zephyr, along with flip-flops, I, I mean, that probably means we're going to need some clock signal running around our chip somewhere to make those work. Okay, anything else? Okay. Yeah, so so we're gonna need some wires. Okay. So if, if I send you into the lab with a breadboard and a bunch of gates, you're not gonna get very far without having some wires to connect them. Okay, so you need wires. And on a chip, we need uh IO. Okay. So we need some way to essentially get from from some pin into, into the internal logic on our chip. Okay. So, uh, yeah. And so what else do we have on the FPGAs? Those of you that know more about them, what other building blocks are there? We have DSP, which is like link blocks. Okay, so some multiply, accumulate, adders. Okay, well, we can make those with, with these things, okay? It's fat, we can make faster ones if we make custom ones, but that's a nice to have thing, okay? Jay? I've noticed a lot of buffers. A lot of buffers, okay. We'll just kind of group that in with the wires, and but, but you're right, down at kind of, to make all this work, there's a lot of buffers and drivers and kind of down at the transistor level to connect all this stuff together, there's a lot more details, but. Kind of our, our little cartoon picture we're going to draw. We can pretty much do, I mean, do you believe me? Can you do any digital circuit with this stuff? Maybe. It might not be run fast enough, okay, but, but you can pretty much do any digital circuit with these really simple basic building blocks of logic, some flip-flops, and connections between them. That's that's really all it takes, and so FPGAs essentially are, are actually not okay. They are pretty complex, but but at the heart, there's just really a lot of simple elements all connected together. Okay, so let me make sure I'm sticking to my plan here. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna erase things. I'm just gonna keep it on one board for the camera purposes. Okay, so we're making our FPJ. Let's start with step one. We need some gates. So put yourself back in time to, was it 1984? 85, 84, okay. You're designing FPJ. What kind of gates do you wanna put in? How could you go about doing this? You put in a bunch of NAND gates, some NOT gates. Maybe we want some, how many inputs should they have? 
two, three, four. Maybe we could just like drop down an assortment of all sorts of different gates all over the place and then worry about kind of wiring them up later, okay? We could do that. You could make a chip where you just had all sorts of different gates and when you needed them, you could, you could wire them up, okay? So uh, Dr. Lloyd mentioned a PLC, which my understanding is, is mainly just a bunch of AND gates and OR gates such that you can make a kind of sum of products expression by connecting up programmable wires. Is that a fair? Yeah. Okay. So uh, that, that would be one way to do it. it, would just be dump down a bunch of gates and hope for the best. Okay. It, it would be okay, but you might find that, I mean, what would be less desirable about that? Limited quantities of each gate. Yeah, maybe you like have a design that uses a bunch of one kind of gate and you're like, ah, what a waste. I have all these extra gates that I'm not using. So it, it would be really nice if, if we could make programmable gates that could do any logic function. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about how those are built. That's what we, as far as I know, have essentially always used in FPGAs. They've changed a bit over time. Uh, but so, okay, so let's do this. Let's say I just want to make two input gates. So, oops, I already screwed up my truth table. Okay. Okay, so let's see, maybe I want an AND gate. Okay, and, oops, I wanted an OR gate. Okay, so there's all these different, how many different logic expressions can I make here? 16. 16, okay. We have four entries in the truth table. Really, all that's really happening here is I'm changing essentially these entries, right? Okay, so, so a programmable logic function is really just, I get to pick the outputs of my truth table. So uh, what we end up doing is we essentially just build a circuit that, that does this for us, okay? So uh, I'm gonna clean this up a little bit, give myself a little more room. Okay, so let's say we wanna make an AND gate. And I'm going to call this the A input and the B input, we'll call this uh, X. Okay. So then one way to build this is to just build a bunch of muxes and these can be um, essentially programmable bits of memory that are, are wired up. Connect them. Okay, so, so do you believe me it works that way? Whatever, right, if, let's test it out. If they're both one, then these two make it through the first stage and then we choose the bottom one. So if the inputs are one, one, we're gonna choose from this memory, any other combination of inputs, a zero will get connected out to X. Okay, so sure enough, this circuit will, will build an AND gate. It's total overkill for an AND gate, right? I, I needed, three two to one muxes just to build one two input AND gate. So a mux is a three input function. So I've got three three input functions to build one two input function. Total overkill, but it's programmable. 
I could change these bits in memory. Okay, and I could reprogram these bits in memory. Okay, and I've made this into an OR gate with the same circuit. Okay, so in, in the FPGAs, we call this uh, a lookup table or a LUT because, hey, we are looking up the value in our truth table. The circuit is literally based on the inputs, looking up a certain value, going through the table and picking one and, and choosing the output based on how we have it programmed. You want to sit and stare at that and sink it in, let it sink in a little. It's pretty cool. You believe that it works? I've convinced you. Questions? Okay, so two input logic functions aren't too exciting. Okay, so now again, A still goes into all of these, B goes in here, and now this input C goes into the last box. Okay, but again, this will choose from now my eight entries in my lookup table. Okay, so I need eight bits of memory to store my logic function. And so now we've made what we call a three input lookup table. Okay, you may be going, well, there's eight things, but remember that the table is size eight, but the inputs are really the selectors to the mux, it's just A, B, and C. Yeah, so was the previous one in the top half, was that a lot two? Yeah, so the previous one was a, was a lot two or a two input lookup table. And we've doubled it to make a three input lookup table. Okay, so what if I wanted to make a four input lookup table? Two threes. Two threes. I could double this whole structure again. Okay, I'll do tick marks. I mean, copying, right? <laughs> and add another mux, and this would be D coming in here. And okay, so on FPGAs today, there are six input logic functions. So after this doubling, I'd have to double it again and then double it again. So how many blue boxes on a six lot? 16, 14. It would be Wait, 24 or 64? So a six lot would be 64 in big bits. How many different logic functions could you make? <laughs> Six or no? Uh, two to the 64? Yeah, okay. And this number, okay, so this is two to the, I'll say two to the 64 uh, logic functions, okay? So generalize it for me. If, if I make a K lot, we often use K, I don't know. If I make a K lot, how many logic functions? Two to the K. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, a K lot has two to the two to the K logic functions. So K lot has two to the K config bits, and each of those can be a one or a zero. So it's right. It's pretty impressive. This is a big number. Okay. So every six lot on your FPGA can do just a incomprehensible number of different logic functions. Okay, and then you write up your little code and you're like, oh, I just wanted to like and two wires together. <laughs> and it's like, oh, did you want like 300 transistors to do that? It's total overkill. Okay, so there's there's balance that was made. Like, I mean, all these choices had to be made when they built the FPGAs. Okay, they decided to put in these really big lookup tables even though some of the logic functions that you write are much smaller, uh, 
I, I guess the FPGA companies look at their customers' designs, okay, and they decide that a nice balance would be six LUTs. Okay? It used to be four LUTs when I was maybe an undergrad around then, it seemed to switch from like four LUTs to six LUTs and, and they all got four times as big. Okay. So uh, questions? So one neat thing you can do though, so let's say I have a four LUT here. So I have this and then this again down below. One neat little trick is I could just tap off of here. And if I tap off of there, I could get another output. So if you want to call this output X, I could make this one Y. All right. And I would need to set one of my, this input to be fixed. Okay. So essentially it would just, I'd be using the top half for one logic function and the bottom half for a different log, logic function. And so I can essentially split the LUT in half. And this is really useful for when you write smaller logic functions that don't use six inputs. And so what's the restriction here though? Can you see any restriction? Takes a little bit of forethought here. Can I have like any two different logic functions in both halves? They're still using the same set of inputs. Okay, so you could do in this case like a three input AND gate and a three input OR gate, but they would need to use the same three wires from your design, the same set of inputs. Okay, so you can do two logic functions, but they have to share inputs. In this case, I could do like a, so if I have a six LUT, I can do two five input logic functions. So maybe that would be an AND gate of two signals and an OR gate of two different signals. That would be fine. Or, or an AND gate of five signals and an OR gate of the same five signals. Okay, so there has to be some, some sharing going on to, to make use of this fact. Do you believe me? That have I just kind of hand waved the fact that you can split this? Are you okay with that? So uh, on Monday, Dr. Nelson's going to come and talk about actual Xilinx specific, how, how the people at Xilinx make their FPGAs. And, and maybe he'll, he'll label things more nicely when you look at some diagrams. But often, they don't call this X and Y. They call this 06 and 05, because this is the output of your six input function. And if you happen to use this one, then it's an output of a five input function. It's a lot six. Okay. okay, so, but really what we've made, if, if we, this whole big thing, at the end of the day, we've made a six lot that can take six inputs and have one output. So there's a lot of configuration behind the scenes. Okay. There's 64 config bits, these blue boxes, but they are not signals in your design. They are memory that they don't change. It's going to be those values forever. So this is what happens when you configure or program your FPGA. These are some of these blue boxes, and I'll draw more blue boxes later, but you are really just setting the contents of these memories Okay, so in this case, you are configuring what goes into this circuit to make a programmable gate so that you can make your combinational logic. And so, so literally, if you want to explore, when you get your bit stream for every LUT on your FPGA, there might be 50,000 of them. Okay, for every one of them, there are 64 of those ones and zeros that configure this. Okay, so. It's, it's uh, I think it's, hmm, for your seven series, I'm trying to remember, it's, I think it's about a quarter of the bit stream is these config bits. I, think, I might be making that number up, um, but I, I think it's roughly around there. Yeah. 
think if I did the math right, two to the sixty-four is like eighteen quintillion. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. It's it's I don't know. Our our brains can't comprehend it. So yeah. Okay, so so we've we've done this. We now have programmable combinational gates. That's that's our first piece. Okay. So the next piece is we said we need some storage. This is not as exciting. There you go. We now have some storage. Okay. If you don't know how to build flip-flops, you can go back to 220 and learn how to build flip-flops. But at the end of the day, we're just going to drop a flip-flop down. And we probably want to uh, connect this in here. Okay. And so, And so often we put these just as pairs together on the FPGA, one lookup table with one flip-flop. Okay, I'm lying a little bit because I said there's two outputs. So really, if you look at like the actual Xilinx thing, you'll, you'll kind of see two of these things with, with each LUT. But we're just going to ignore that and we'll leave that for when Dr. Nelson comes and talks about it. Okay. Now you don't always, this is really great for implementing sequential logic. If you go write some, right, always FF, okay. And you say, uh, uh, I, okay. So then you might say X is equal to, oops, Uh, A and B, okay. And so the tools are gonna take your A wire and connect it into here and take your B wire and connect it into there. And it actually doesn't matter where A and B go into this thing. You just essentially update your truth table accordingly. Okay. So it, it doesn't matter if you connect A and B here or, or down the bottom or whatever. Okay. and. Then there, we've made this Verilog in a, in a diagram here, and we will call this X. Okay, but what if I write instead, I don't want it to go into a flip-flop, and I do combinational. So sometimes we want our logic to go into flip-flop, sometimes we don't. So Basically, what we end up doing is we feed this thing into a mux. Okay, and I am regretting drawing this in blue now because I said I'd draw these little boxes, but okay. again, so these things, this actually just becomes an SRAM bit in the memory. And this is another SRAM bit. Another part of your bitstream is going to control the signal that comes out, essentially whether it is registered or unregistered. And you can basically choose between the two paths based on how the person writes their code. So are you okay with this? Questions? So we've made kind of a, a nice little building block here. Okay, and this is kind of, in some ways, we're, we're just gonna keep raising the abstraction and, and putting things together and building our chip up bigger and bigger. Okay. So sometimes people call this like a logic element or an LE. Sometimes an FPGA is different companies use different terminologies, but this is a nice little packaged up unit that we have here. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna erase this. Any questions on this before it goes away?
So then what happens on FPGAs is we take uh, a bunch of these logic elements and we stuff them together. Okay, and it kind of depends on uh, which company you're using for FPGAs and even which generation and family, you might find that there's eight of these in here or 10 of them or 16 or 32 or four, it, it really just depends, but there's a collection of these just all grouped up into one thing that, that we would kind of refer to as, as a tile. And maybe when you look at it with Dr. Nelson, he'll show you that on Xilinx, they even like using the term slice, they put four of them together in one slice and another four and another slice and you end up with eight in the tile, but I don't really care for now. We're just gonna say there's a bunch of these things together in the tile. And so you can imagine what ends up happening you have a whole lot of inputs, okay? maybe six for every one of these, right? And you have some outputs. We kind of said one or, or two if you're talking about real ones. Okay, so something like this. And, and this ends up being a logic tile. And your FPJ is really just a whole bunch of these logic tiles arrayed out in a nice big grid. With, with thousands or, or tens or hundreds of thousands of them, depending on how much money you want to spend on. So we're still kind of just working on one and two here, but now we've kind of packaged it up at a nicer level where we have a bunch of logic together. And now we're gonna tackle number three here, the wires. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and draw some more of these tiles. And you can just pretend that it continues on. Okay, and if you open up Favato and look at the chip editor, you might see something that kind of looks like this as you as you zoom, zoom in and out. Okay, so then how do we connect things? Maybe in our design, we say, hey, I've got some output here and, and it needs to get over to this pin over here. Okay. And we can't just pre-wire things. It, you know, if we just pre-selected all the wires, it would be essentially too inflexible. Right? that the wires themselves need to be programmable for this to really make sense. Otherwise it's just too hard. You wouldn't be able to, you can design circuits too many different ways to just kind of have fixed wiring patterns. Uh, and so this is kind of what sets FPGAs to more programmable territory than just PLAs is that we have this huge sea of wires that we can kind of connect in any way we want with some limitations. And so what ends up happening is what we do is we say, okay, well, we're just gonna, so first of all, you think these, these tiles are pretty big, although we're drawing them small and Vovato draws them small. There's a lot of things in them, right? There, there's all these lots. And I said in this lot, there was like, uh, like 64 muxes in there, I think. Yeah, something like that, 63 muxes maybe. And then we got a couple of flip flops, another mux here, times that by like eight. There's a lot going on in this tile, right? So it's actually pretty big on our chip. I don't know how big, but I mean, we're still talking down in, in the nanometer, micrometer range, but relatively big, right? So, so it's not crazy just to say, oh, we're just gonna make a wire that goes this far. It's just going to essentially run the length of one of our tiles. Okay. And then we could just have a bunch of these. 
my tile words in the way, so I'm going to get rid of it. Okay, and then down here, I'll add some more, and I'm going to start adding them kind of everywhere. And on FPGAs made in the last decade or two, typically these are all unidirectional. So the, essentially that means the wire has some, an input at one end and an output at the other end. And what happens is really to, to drive these wires, we kind of zoom in. Let, let's uh, let's do some zooming in. I'm going to take this little area where wires meet, and let's let's blow it up here a little bit. Okay, so what really happens is if this wire starts here and goes down, okay, then it's inputs at the top. And what really happens is it's just more muxes. We have a mux here who decide, that decides who gets to control this wire. Okay, and the inputs to the mux, okay, they might, maybe you have, this wire is coming in. Maybe this one can, maybe this one goes over here and it's one input. Okay. And maybe this one over here comes in. This guy over here comes in. Okay. What else might we want to be able to drive this mux? Maybe some of these other pins that come off the logic here, right? The output pins of our tiles. So, so these are gonna kind of come in as well, right? From logic tiles. Okay. And they're also gonna be a possible candidate for who gets to drive this wire for this one little wire segment here. And that also means that if this is a wire heading down, then he also has a mux, right? And likewise, kind of half of these wires all have muxes that drive them. And, and these other wires have muxes there, just if I draw the picture zoomed in, this mux is here. And the other one's just for the other guy, it's just down at the other end. So every wire segment, essentially has a mux that chooses who Now we could make a really flexible FPGA by saying that every wire coming in can connect out to every other wire as we meet these crossroads here. But that would be really expensive because these muxes would need to be really big. Right, I, I've drawn four here, but on real commercial FPGAs, it wouldn't be unrealistic for this to be like two or 300 wires wide. Okay, so like two or 300 wires here and here and here and here and everywhere. So, so I wasn't exaggerating when I was saying millions of wires on your FPGA that, that connect everything. So in reality, we just let, wires come from a few different places and control this. And as long as every wire can be driven from a handful of different places, we basically just punt the problem to the CAD tools and say, hey, the Vivado is gonna figure out how to connect all these things up in some way that we can really make this all work. And so that maybe you can 
essentially come out here and hop into some mucks down here and maybe you get on this wire and you go down and over here and, and eventually you end up uh, coming into the input of your pin. Okay, so questions on this? Making sense a little bit? Okay, so I've drawn these all as kind of short wires, but but in reality, there'd be a mixture. So some of these would be really short like this. Other ones would be, would be twice as long. And they might span two tiles. And there'd kind of be some overlap here. Okay. And kind of the same in the vertical mention here is so some of these wires are stopping and starting at these crossroads but others are just kind of cruising on through okay and and going to a longer distance and so if you go in and the fpgas that you use in 220 okay there would be a mixture of wires that go one tile two tiles four tiles six tiles uh 12, 14, I think up to like 16 or 18 tiles. So some really long ones that you can imagine like hopping on the highway, you hop on and then you go really far, but you don't need as many of those because ideally you want all your design, the things that are connected to be close together so that it's faster. And so the tools are gonna to do everything in their power to put your things close together that are connected when it decides where to put them. But sometimes you still have to get everywhere. You might have a reset signal and it's used in like 40 different places in your, your design, okay? And, and so it's gotta go all over the place. So you might use all sorts of different wire lengths. And the, the architectures you use in class, there's even diagonal ones that go kind of up four and over two and things like that. And, and I don't know why Xilinx decided to build them with kind of ones that have all these assortments of patterns, probably they tried out their customer designs and decided that it would be good to build FPGAs this way and it would make the, their designs run faster. Uh, so, um, yeah, so we kind of same thing. We, we might have some longer wires here that are coming in and other ones, some longer ones that might just be passing through. Okay. And, and this one might come and, sorry, that's bad, and continue on. And so Movado, when you open up the FPGA editor, it doesn't really draw it. it. It doesn't draw the mucks, but it still draws it the same way. It just draws it without the mucks. And it's like, oh, all of these different things can come to this point, it's, they just come to a point and leave, and that's that's how they choose to draw. Usually, they draw them with kind of they draw this box, and then they draw these as, as dotted lines to say, "Oh, you can essentially optionally connect these." But optionally connect really just means which input you're choosing with with this mux here. Okay, and so again, one sec, I'll grab your question. This mux is just again controlled by a bunch of configuration bits. Okay, so again, more, more SRAM, more parts of your bit stream. And so if you look at your FPGA bit stream, it is largely going to be the init strings to control your combinational logic and all of these to control the muxes in your routing to see which wires connect to which wires. That's, that's gonna be like probably between those two things like 80 or 90% of your bit stream. I don't, I'm just making up these numbers, but I'm probably not that far off, so. Oh, question? Okay, okay. Yeah, so, um, okay, we got just about everything. We, we, kind of got the wires so you can programmably connect one pin to another one. 
And then some of these blocks are just going to be special IO blocks. And the IO blocks job is it can be configured. And so this is going to be to okay, I, I draw it more correctly here. This is going to be a pin on your FPGA. Okay. So this goes out to some small little wire pin. I should have I could pull up a picture, but you know what I mean? Just the actual metal contact on the chip. Okay. And and this might be at like 3.3 volts or, or something like that, okay? And then its job is to come out here and they'll be essentially into the fabric where you might be running at something like 0 0.95 volts and you can have an input or an output there. And that's the IO's job. I don't know how it works. It's really more uh, analog circuit component, okay? but it, it does voltage conversion. It can drive the current on the pin and it can be configured to be an output or an input. And it's really the kind of the bridge between the digital and the analog world. I mean, these are still digital pins, but you know what I mean? It's, its job is to do voltage conversion and do input output switching. And, but then at this point, it's really just comes out and connects into the same routing that's everywhere else. And so your chip might be surrounded by IOs. You might find a column of IOs going right down the middle of your chip. Yeah. So with, with IOs, when you look at a net list and you see like IOBUF or OBUF, how do buffers work with the IOs? Well, it's the same kind of idea that this can be configured to do different things. And so again, we just kind of got, sorry, these are bad squares. Just some SRAM bits, some part of your bit stream that's gonna configure this IO. It might configure as an input or an output. It might choose a voltage level or some slew rate of, of things like that. Or you can even configure whether there's a pull up or pull down resistor on this IO built in. So they're quite fancy things. Uh, but you're right, if you look at your netlist, there's going to be an IO and it's going to have essentially this on one end and these input output connections on the other. And the design, it just tells it essentially how to configure this. And that, that's also just part of your bit streams, how to configure the IO. So that's pretty much it. We've um, that that's basically these are the basic building blocks of making a part that can do arbitrary digital circuits. So there's fancier things. There's there's memories, big chunks of memories, big chunks of multipliers, and things like that. But there's nothing too terribly surprising about that. They just pop out a part of the chip and say, okay, uh, this is now going to be a memory. Okay. And the, the norm for FPGAs, I don't have a bottle up, so I can look, is to do column-based design. So it'll have columns of memories and then maybe a few columns of logic and then column of multipliers and a few column of logic and then maybe an IO column. And they do that just so that when they're actually laying out the chip at a low level, it's just all a nice uniform size that can fit together. And they basically just can design one thing and stamp it out uh, everywhere. So you can do bigger things. There might be CPUs, there might be PCIe controllers, ethernet controllers, DDR controllers. There's, there's a lot more going on than just these things. And again, the reason is just speed. We could make all of these things out of LUTs and flip-flops, but you saw it's a lot, we pay a lot of overhead for this programmability. So the, we looked at the flip or the LUT, okay? And there's all these muxes to make a programmable logic function. If you're really just built out of, out of transistors, the logic function you wanted, okay, instead of 
64 multiplexers all connected together, it would be much faster. And so if you know you just want a DDR controller or you just want a PCIe or ethernet controller, you can make it run at much faster clock speeds if you just stamp that thing down instead of using your reprogrammable stuff. And so that's why if you kind of look at the generations of FPGAs over the last couple of decades, it just kind of hits a limit. It used to be more stuff was done programmable and it was like, oh, it's not keeping up with current standards for PCIe or things like that. It's like, okay, then the new generation has a hardened block. That's sometimes you'll, with FPGAs you'll hear say soft or hard. Soft means we're making it out of these basic parts. And hard means that component has been built out of silicon, that CIE controller, Ethernet controller, it's just there permanently. Okay, so we used to do more CPUs out of soft logic. You can still do that, but now most of the chips you're using have, have hardened CPUs built into the, the FPGA. And so when Dr. Nelson's here, he, I know he's gonna pull up Avado and show you the picture and you can ask him where all that stuff is. And, he can point it out, so. All right, anything else? You Does it make more sense now? Does it helps a little? Okay. Some of the magic is look behind the curtain and seeing the wizard. I'm not the wizard. <laughs> Whoever came up with all of this. So. Anything to add, Dr. Lloyd? Well, I just had a question as to how many of you have had the 220 course here at BYU, PCA 220. Okay, great. Yeah, because that covers some fundamentals, not as wonderfully presented. Oh, as we have, but it's always good to hear it twice, anyway. So, yeah. Kind of a little taste or a flavor of some of this. So, curious. Yeah. So, I also hope you come away from this with a bit more appreciation. When you sit there in Bovado and you hit generate bitstream, and you're like, I can't believe I have to wait like five whole minutes for this. Um, there's a lot of choices that have to be made here about exactly every little wire that's going to be used and where to put every little thing in your design. The, the combinations are literally like endless of, of the ways that you could put the down on the chip. And so there's a lot of algorithms and things that go into using this. We just talked all about how the hardware is built, but the hardware is pretty useless without all the algorithms that, that kind of go along with it to just turn your Verilog into a bunch of ones and zeros that populate these different memories. Okay, so that's, that's Vivada's job. That's why it's working so hard for so long to do that. And, uh, and, and that's, that's also kind of active, active research area all the time as well, so. All right, well, let's finish it off. And uh, so I think the rest of the schedule is uh, on Friday is an offline module. It's about Vovato and Tickle. So uh, through 220, you learn how to use Vovato through the GUI. And uh, in this offline module, Dr. Nelson talks about how to do it all through Tickle. You can automate a lot more. You can do things with make files and scripts and stuff like that. And stuff that's more shareable amongst your team and better for pushing up to Git or GitHub. Uh, and so I encourage you to go through that if you're working with Vivado in your project. And then next week we have two more. So Dr. Nelson's gonna talk, he's gonna kind of continue the picture but really dump into a real Xilinx part. And now that you've seen, we, we often call this the cartoon picture. This is kind of just the nice colors and without getting into the nitty gritty and, and all the unfortunate side cases and things like that. But he'll go into that a bit more. And then on, on uh, Wednesday, Hayden, Hayden's a PhD student here. Uh, he's gonna go over RapidWrite, which is uh, an open source tool from Xilinx that essentially lets you manipulate, manipulate your design and how it's like implemented on the fabric. So like, quite an open source of Avato, but it lets you get in and, and change your design through Java or Python uh, programmably. So uh, he's gonna go over that. And that's basically our whole FPGA track. There's a, there's a lot, more, lot more modules on the schedule. Uh, I don't have the projector here. 
You can look at it. These are ones we have videos for last year. But they're, some of them are more niche topics and they depend on your research project for the summer. And so the best thing to do is ask your advisor or your grad student mentor and say, hey, do you think it would be worth learning about this thing? And they might say, no, like you're not gonna touch that at all this summer. They might say, you're not gonna touch it, but if you wanna go learn it for your own benefit, that's fine too. Um, but, but just know that there's a lot more there than just kind of the, the four items on the calendar for the PGA track this year. So, all right, now I think I'm actually done. Thanks.